we live in a world of turmoil, don't we, where we perhaps find it difficult in some ways and, and perhaps most people find it difficult in, in some ways to understand what is going on. We think of it in terms of uh, the greed of man bringing back war and, and hatred. We think in terms of the way that we have abused the world in terms of climate change and, and the floods and the, the uh, droughts that we've been experiencing. But these things sometimes are sent from God to turn us back to himself. But sadly, we recognise, even from, from this, that, that people do not honour God. It is only those that he calls to himself who, who love and honour and serve him who will turn to the living God. And we, we need in these days uh, for a revival amongst God's people that they might lead back into ways of righteousness. There is nothing in the Bible mandating tithing on Christians. However, the Bible indicates that tithing is one way that we should honour God, the God who gives us all things. There is nothing in the Bible that says Christians must spend their Sundays in church services. However, many commentators think Sabbath dedicated to worship and honouring God is a creation ordinance for all time. And history tells us that the early church did meet on Sundays in this way. We are called to love God and our fellow man. But love, even though described as being greater than faith and hope, does not so trump truth that we can ignore truth. We are called to be holy, but we are not to be so holy that we live in isolation from the world around us. So you might argue that we have to adopt a balanced position on some of these things. But what about the call to live a sacrificial life? In 1854, HMS Heckler was bombarding the Bomberzand, a Russian fort in Finland during the Crimea War. The fort returned fire and an unexploded shell landed on the deck of the ship. Everyone flung themselves flat on the deck uh, to hopefully protect themselves if the shell exploded, all except one man. Charles Lucas stepped forward, picked up the shell and threw it overboard, thus protecting everybody on the ship. <coughs> Lucas was awarded the first Victoria Cross. In 1976, there was a hotel fire in the Italian ski resort of Zapada. John Clements, a school teacher leading a party of English school children, climbed down the outside balconies and lowered children to the ground using sheets. Then he went back into the fire and brought out other hotel guests to safety until finally he was overcome by the smoke and the heat. For his actions, Clement was awarded the George Cross. It is by no, uh, no coincidence that these awards are commemorated with a cross. Originally a means of execution, a cross was a symbol of humiliation, of disgrace and terrible suffering. But now the cross is recognised as a symbol of sacrifice. Though Lucas survived his uh, incident, the criteria for the award of the Victoria Cross or the George Cross include that the action will probably result in the death of those who undertake such action, as was in the case of John Clement. Those who were crucified were definitely expected to die. It was an extreme form of execution. If an executed criminal lived, then the executioner was not doing his job and would almost certainly put his own life at risk. So for the symbol of a cross 
to change completely its meaning, something significant must have happened. That significant event was the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sentenced to death for crimes that he had not committed, Jesus' death became recognised as the sacrifice for the sins of all who would put their trust in him. But this was not simply a brave deed to save the lives of others. Romans 5 reminds us that people would rarely sacrifice them for a righteous, themselves for a righteous person, though they might for someone who was very good. But God's love is shown to us in that Jesus died for us while we were sinners, enemies of God, people who had rebelled against his rule. Thus the cross is now a symbol of sacrifice, not simply of bravery. Though the Victoria Cross is for valour and the George Cross is for gallantry, valour and gallantry are not the way that we would describe Jesus' actions in allowing himself to be unjustly crucified for crimes that he had not done. No, this was truly a sacrifice, just as the Passover lamb was sacrificed on behalf of the people of Israel, the innocent suffering for the guilty, something that did not apply in the instances of Lucas or Clements. But what does that have to do with us? Yes, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus is the means by which our sins are atoned for before a holy God. But isn't that it? Does the cross continue to have any other meaning for Christians? Isn't it just a symbol people use to signify their religious allegiance, like some use a fish symbol? Or is it a sign that, they, that people use as hopefully... Uh, seeking protection from God by God? No, there is a fundamental piece of teaching that extends the meaning of the cross beyond the death of our Lord. Even before his death, Jesus taught the concept of sacrifice to his disciples by using the cross as a means to guide their lives. In Luke 9, Jesus was teasing out from them, from the disciples, their understanding of who he is. Whilst the people around them merely thought that Jesus might be a mighty prophet, even a reincarnation of an earlier prophet or the return of the prophet Elijah. Whilst that was the popular view, Peter voiced his conclusion that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah, who would come and redeem God's people. He just didn't understand how. Whilst confirming this view, Jesus highlights his reason for coming into the world. He had come as the eternal sacrifice who must be killed. It would be the manner of his death that would become a guiding principle for their own lives and even for their deaths in many cases. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. There is no indication here that a cross is an optional extra for a follower of the Lord Jesus. If you go back to the 1970s, there was almost a cult made out of symbolically dragging a cross on some personal pilgrimage, famously from coast to coast in the USA. Whilst this may have had some value to the individual in providing them with some sort of cathartic experience, 
and value from the nation embedding this symbol of the cross in the national life. In many respects, such symbolic journeys missed the point of what Jesus was saying. It was not the cross itself that was to become the symbol. It was the sacrifice of one's life that was to reflect the life of the disciple. Symbols are only symbols if they are symbols of something else. We need to look beyond the symbol. Think for a moment of Jesus' teaching in John chapter 13. As the disciples settled down at the last Passover, celebrated with the Lord Jesus, he, the host, got up from the table and performed the work of the lowliest servant. He washed the disciples' feet. Symbolic though this gesture might largely have been, it nevertheless caused Peter to protest indignantly. But instead of being rewarded for his boldness, Peter is sternly warned that if he does not allow the Messiah to serve him, then he could have no part in the salvation that Jesus was about to purchase for him on his cross. Unless I wash you, he said, you have no part in me. But then John goes on. When he, that is Jesus, had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked to them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Here is a truer meaning of taking up one's cross. We are to serve. We might frequently hear politicians saying that as they take high office, they are doing so in order to serve. But rarely is there any humility in their service. Normally it's a case of, I've got an agenda to push through to make everyone do what I want. I know what's best for everyone else. I'm in charge. You are going to do things my way. But Jesus said, Now that I, your Lord, your teacher, have humbled myself to the position of the lowest servant to wash your feet. This is an example of the sacrificial life that you are to follow. You are to serve each other in the same way. You are to humble yourself. You are to take the lowest task. And you'll remember from Luke 9 that Jesus set a child before them as a similar example of taking the low position. Again, Jesus went on to explain to them that he would have to take on even more menial position. He was to take on the position of the condemned criminal. His death would take on the significance of the routine slaughter of an animal in the temple. He would be despised and rejected by men as he is led out, stripped naked, and nailed to a cross for everyone to gawp at. He would be mocked, spat upon, flogged within an inch of his life, cursed. It would be a sight that even made men turn away in horror and disgust. The creator, the ruler of the world, would be held in such low esteem by his own creation that they would be appalled at the sight. Here is the meaning of living a sacrificial life. And let us be clear, we are to live a sacrificial life as well as being prepared to die a sacrificial death if so called to do so. There was something of courage and bravery that marked out 
Christ, uh, Charles Lucas, who, stopped, who stepped forward to throw the shell off of the ship. It was an act of service, a willingness to give his life to try and save his comrades. The recognition of these characteristics led ultimately to Lucas being promoted to Rear Admiral. John Clements, too, was an outstanding character. His achievements were well known and established even before he sacrificed his life for his students and other unknown hotel guests. One thing I found on the internet described him in this way. His honesty, integrity, courage, good humour and enthusiasm for life were there in all his actions and words for everyone to see and hear. He was often described as a really genuine person. Many people have particular memories of John and however varied they might be, they all illustrated his wholeheartedness and selfless approach to life. The high standards he held for himself were an example to those who were associated with him and he upheld them to the very last. His integrity was epitomised in his final actions when he put the safety of his pupils in his care above that of himself. So, do we have to be someone important, someone of note, before we can be humble? No, sacrifice is not about greatness, though greatness may be involved. Think for a moment of Joseph, a boy chosen and prepared by God to save his family, his nation, God's people, often seen as one of the best types of Christ in scripture. His life was not easy before he was appointed to power in Egypt. Sibling hatred almost led to his death and certainly led to his being enslaved. But faithfulness to God, standing against the values of the world, led to him being unjustly imprisoned. Joseph had a greater perspective on his life. He understood that God led, even through trials and difficulties, to bring about a greater purpose. His task was to endure faithfully. Gideon was no great warrior when he was called to lead a tiny raiding party against a vast horde of the enemy. He even had to stand by while God dismissed the bulk of his army to make it clear that victory belonged to the unseen God. Sacrifice involved dependence on God in the face of great danger. These men became great leaders under the hand of God. But what about the widow of Zarephath, called on to sacrifice her last meal to a passing stranger who gave her the unlikely promise that her jar of flour and her cruise of oil would have sufficient until the end of the famine? The young girl taken into slavery by a foreign army uh, that had uh, taken her freedom away, but nevertheless witnessed to the power of her God. It led to Naaman, the commander of the enemy army, who had conquered her nation, being restored to health from the deadly disease of leprosy. The widow in the temple who gave her last two coins to the temple of her God was praised by Jesus. Nothing in her actions spoke of her true motive, but the Lord Jesus knew. He saw and he knew her heart. He praised her sacrifice and her total commitment to honour God with all that she had. Had she lived a sacrificial life? Or had she finally come to the end of herself? And had she at that point just come to the understanding that God himself was worth more than everything that she had in life? It is one thing to give up things in this life to gain greater, to risk all for greatness. But what about those who gave up all that they had to suffer in order, uh, in order to suffer? 
Hosea, a prophet of the living God who gave up dignity to marry a prostitute, and a prostitute who would bring further humiliation by unfaithfulness to her husband, who sacrificed everything for her and for the message of God uh, to an unfaithful nation. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet called by God to proclaim his truth to a wayward, wicked nation, hated by the people and the leaders, his family even plotted to take his life. He was beaten and publicly humiliated by, for obeying God's call on his life. Finally, his message was rejected in the face of great danger. He was forcibly taken by the people back to Egypt, the place that God had forbidden them to go. The scriptures are littered with examples of people who sacrificed the good things of this life for a better hope. Think of that chapter, uh, Hebrews 11. And what what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Their hope for the future was so real that they were prepared to sacrifice all in this life to to gain something greater. Their trust, their day-to-day dependence was on God alone. Only by his power would they triumph. What does eternity mean to you? How real is heaven to you? Are you so sure of God's promise of eternal blessings in his presence that you would give up all for him? We are not all called to commit some brave act. We are not all called to be leaders of nations. We are not all called to suffer bitter persecution or even death. But a disciple, a follower of Christ, is called to live a sacrificial life. We are called to be a people who proclaim the message of salvation, even when it is not popular. There are those in this land who have done that and ended up in a police cell because someone objected to what was said. We are called to hold firmly to the truth. There are those in this country who have sought to uphold biblical standards in their life or in society in general. Some have ended up in court because someone objected to their views. There are people who have lost their jobs in this way. There are churches and Christian organisations who have been ejected from venues because their values did not agree with those of wider society. There are those who have spoken out against unbiblical social values and as a result have faced a barrage of abuse on social media. There is a cost to walking in Christ's way, 
We are not free to spend our time as we wish, as the rest of the world does. We are not free to spend our money on ourselves as the, the rest of the world does. We are not free to live our lives, to behave as the rest of the world does. We instead must seek to live to glorify God. As Paul says in Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. There is so much more that we could say on this topic of sacrifice, but we do need to keep this sacrifice in perspective Jesus sacrificed himself for us. But in, so, in doing so, he set us an example not only of how to live and die, but also how he valued his life and death. Hebrews 12, 1 and 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw, everything, uh, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. It is this ultimate perspective of the joy that awaits us that should help shape our lives. In Romans 2, Paul reminds us, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will, will, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then, then the Gentile, but glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good. And then a little later, he point, uh, Paul points to uh, Job chapter 41, 11, where, Je where God speaks to Job. Who has a claim against me that I must pay? God is no man's debtor, as this is often rephrased as. And therefore, we can expect to receive eternal blessings beyond value in comparison to any sacrificial life that we live. Perhaps you're used to having a three-point sermon. Most of us are. But I really just want to leave you with one point to consider. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Live a life of sacrifice to honour him who gave his all for you. And that is the theme of our last hymn. Jesus, I my cross have taken all to leave and follow thee, naked, poor, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my all shall be. We read in, um, um, in, in Luke chapter 9, didn't we, of those that Jesus called to follow him, and he reminded them that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests to live in, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And we too must be prepared to give up all to follow Jesus.